Well, the very first mission, we weren't shot down. The pilot in command made a mistake, and he rolled the throttle off and rolled us inverted. We tumbled through the trees. And I went to the, the major and said, I want to fly one of those little helicopters out there. I said, I understand it's a single pilot, and I deserve the right, you know, to make my own mistakes. And he said, the life expectancy of a scout pilot's only six weeks. You don't want that, son. I said, sir, I didn't make it through the first day, which was, that was our first real mission. <laughs> and we went down. So I said, six weeks seems like a long time. And then I got into the scouts and we went down getting shot up the other four times, four or five times. A couple, we crashed through the trees. Then a couple, uh, I was trying to do a, a rescue and it didn't work out in a helicopter, tail rotor field, we crashed. And then a couple, I, I got shot up and an aircraft about blew the big hole in the side of the aircraft and we're leaking fuel and I made it to a runway then they mortared us. <laughs> I was 22 years old and I thought okay how many times can you go down think about this sooner or later it has to be your last time so every time I went down I thought now I've used up all the times it's going to happen I'm good to go. Uh, Huey got shot up and uh, the major came to me he says well my nickname was Punjab he says Punjab go out and find out who got him. I said, I know who got him. The bad guy's got him. He looks smart. He go out there and find him. So I went out and I found him. Now, this is a couple guys regrettably got killed in that Huey. Well, I found the base camp. The Cobra puts me in a general area, and I was blessed with eyesight that, you know, get a blessing from God. I could see things that a lot of the scout pilots couldn't see. And I had a phenomenal gunner with good eyesight, and he picked up some stuff, too. It wasn't just me. I had a gunner that found as much as I did. And I found a base camp and I saw these little silver cylinders, knowing this is the base camp that shot up a Huey. And I'd already been down four times, four or five. I landed out in a rice paddy, got out, snuck into the base camp, and I was stealing stuff out of the base camp just for an adrenaline rush. It was I mean, it was sinking in the mud. And I thought, oh my God, so the tail rotor hits water, I'm ruined. So I hopped in and I got us out. I told Steve, my gunner, the one that saved me, this was, you know, later. Fly this thing back while I my buckle in. So we went, we rearmed. It was rice in those cylinders. So we went back and started shooting up the base camp, shooting inside the bunkers, trying to draw fire to make sure. Because we saw bunkers, but we didn't see any people. Well, then all of a sudden, the world opened up. And uh, we had, uh, there are pictures of that helicopter. We took 120 hits in that little tiny loach. And they only got me like three times. They got Steve Williams in the butt and shot out our controls and we crashed. But I actually got out, ran around out, snuck into that base camp to steal stuff out of it for the adrenaline rush. And I'd done that before the base camps. So that, that was the, the last one, that was my fifth time where I went to the base camp, came back, rearmed, refueled, went back out. And then, uh, like I said, I got shot up pretty bad. And after we crashed, uh, I was already starting to lose it. I was bleeding so heavily from my leg and my arm. Steve told me later, he pulled me out of the helicopter. I remember looking around and saying, oh no, we're in the middle of the base camp. I recognized where we were because I had oriented and it was this little bush that I used as a focal point. And I said, oh man, <laughs> I didn't know until recently that and I, I was laying there. Steve laid me down and I was bleeding real bad. And I remember saying, Steve, get out of here. I'm not going to make it. There's no way I can make it. I'm just laying here. Everything's going gray. I can't move. And I remember he, he told me later, he said, well, Mr. Garvey, just where do you expect me to go? <laughs> In the middle of a base camp, 18 year old kid. And uh, so he started bandaging me up and that's when still no pain. And he started saying, oh, I got to stop the bleeding. I got to stop the bleeding. Mr. Garvey, I got to stop it. I can't stop the bleeding. Look at this. And I said, I don't want to look at that. And, and then I started feeling a tingling in my arm and things started getting, I remember, blurry, and I started to get tunnel vision. And I thought, uh-oh, well, I wonder what's happening here. And then everything went gray. And the pain, there was no pain, but even the tingling sensation started to disappear. And then that's when it's everything went black. And I said, now I know I'm in trouble because I'm in the middle of the base camp. I can't move. I'm blind. I know we're surrounded by the enemy, so I guess this is how it ends. Like, oh, well. And I kind of, I remember thinking, hey, they can't do anything to me. If I could see they walked up and threatened me, I'm thinking, guys, I'm going to die.
You can't, you can't threaten me. You can't hurt me. I'm going to die any minute. And then I could start having this really strange physical feeling. And I thought, what is this? Why, what am I feeling? And then it dawned on me, I thought, oh, I am in the process of dying. This is what it feels like. It was like an energy being drained from me. I said, I'm going to be dead any second. Wow. <laughs> and, and then all of a sudden, the black went to a little speck. It, the black, everything was black. And then it started getting smaller and smaller. So I, like I was looking at a speck. And then I'm, I'm looking down at me. And I thought, how can I see me all of a sudden? My head laying next to this bush. And then everything went away and faded, and I was seeing nothing. And I thought blind people saw darkness. I was seeing nothing, and that's hard to imagine. You know, I had no sensation of sight at all. And then I'm thinking, what is this? That seeing nothing, I, I started seeing like light, and then it got brighter and brighter, and all of a sudden, that's when I started feeling like I was enveloped in this, this light. But I could feel it, and that's when I was being enveloped in God's love. And I says, oh, wow, I'm in heaven, but I don't see anything. And then I felt this presence, and God didn't talk to me. I had no vocal cords, but, like, his thoughts were my thoughts. And uh, he, he was concerned about me, and, and I says, wow, I'm, I'm in heaven. But I said, this, how can I be here? I don't have a body. What, what, I'm, like, floating. And that's when I started feeling my arms and my legs and everything, and that's when I could feel my left hand and my right hand, and I'm thinking, there's something not right here because I'm complete. I don't have an arm, but I can feel both hands. And I feel my body. And then God said, I want you to step out of that. You know, he made known to me. He didn't say the word, but I knew what his thoughts were. He said, I want you to step out and join me into this, my, my world. And I kind of, I used the word stepped out, but somehow I, I willed it. And I was out of that body and it frightened me. Because now all of a sudden I was everywhere. I was in his entire cosmos. I was the entire, you know, they say God is everywhere. I was everywhere. That's why I tell people when you die, you don't go to heaven. You don't go anywhere. You become everywhere. And I thought, oops. And I went back into my body real quick where I felt safe. And I was hiding in that form. And then like, God said, no, come on. He's coaxing me out. And I did that three or four times. But when I was out is when I had that, that incredible feeling of power and knowledge and love and happiness. And then it dawned on me, going in that body was horrible. It was so confined, like I was being tied and bound up with ropes. I said, I don't want to go into that body. And God said, you can if you want. Anytime you can go back in your body and have that body, or you could be out here and I want you to, and I, my words, not his, I want you to join me in, in the, co the whole cosmos and know all these things, all the wonders. I, I, it's like a billion supercomputers. You can go inside an atom and look at it and know it. You can go inside a cell and know it from the inside, the outside, or you can go to another planet and look at that planet, or you or you can be, I didn't see it, but you can be together with your friends. Anything you want, you can have in heaven. I could, I could see it in my head, but I, I, I don't know how because I didn't have a body and I didn't have eyes, but if I wanted to see a planet or I wanted to see a cell, like I did see that for a while where I'm inside that root of this little bush and I'm seeing all the like little veins and the roots of the tree and millions of little molecules of nutrients and the cells and feeding the leaves. And I'm going, so that's how that works. Why couldn't I see it before? And then God was telling me, so this is just a tiny example of what you're going to be able to see and do. You will know all things. And all of a sudden he gave me a vision and these two hands came out of nowhere and they're holding this little premature baby just being born. And I was a preemie when I was born. And he said, like, this is how I see you. And he, I felt his emotions. And he was a proud father looking at me being born into heaven, like born again into his world. And I don't know if it was symbolic or what. He said, even in the state that you were in, acknowledging that I was like a super God, you cannot begin to comprehend what I am. So even in that state, I was still unable to even have a, a clue of how powerful and immense God was. He is that powerful and knowing and loving. And I thought, well, that kind of put me in my place. <laughs> he's just laughing at me and loving me. And he's so amused. 
you know, like the little kid that puts on a towel and thinks he's Superman. God was amused at how excited I was. He was happy for me. Everything that exists is heaven. You know, I tell people to put it this way. People watch so many movies and they, they misuse the term God. You know, here's a God on Mount Olympus, right? Well, God, everything that exists in the entire, every particle of matter and energy that exists is God. He's not somewhere in the cosmos. He is the cosmos. He can be in it and out at the same time. But I say God is that man on Mount Olympus. And he is Mount Olympus. And he is Greece. And he is the planet Earth. And he is the solar system. And he is the galaxy and on and on. That is what God is. Everything that exists, it's not that God is inside the cosmos. He is the cosmos. People say Jesus Christ is the son of God. Yes, he is. But so are we. And I, and I tell people, when God the Father talks to God the Son, he's talking to himself inside himself. Because he is both. But he is the ultimate. If, like if God were not to, if, you know, people say God is dead. He can't die, obviously. So when I thought I'm a super God, God showed me that image briefly. And he said, welcome you know, to my world. You're being born again into my world now. And I want you to go out and, you know, and, and enjoy all this. And then that disappeared. And that's after that, after that image of the little premature baby disappeared. That's when he said, you need to get out of your body. But I'm thinking, I don't have one. I don't see anything. So after that, I, I went out and I'm thinking, this is incredible. This isn't what I thought. I, My friend, then all of a sudden a bad thought in my head. I thought, oh, no, all my family, my friends, they're going to think I died this horrible death in the jungles of Vietnam. And my buddy Steve was tormented for years because he thought I died. And uh, I'll get to that in a minute. So what happened is I said, oh, no. And I said a prayer. I said, Mom, I'm sorry. And my brothers, my sisters, but Mom in particular, I said, I'm sorry, because I finished the tour and I volunteered to go back. Actually, I only made it six weeks on my extension. And uh, I said, I'm sorry that I came back and did this to you. I survived the first tour, beat up and all that, but, you know, from the crashes. And then God said, um, you're not ready. I said, what? <laughs> He said, you're not ready. And, and, and then it's about that time I felt I was sad and you're not supposed to have any bad feelings in heaven and, and God sadness that what we do to each other. And I'm thinking I'm, I'm what I did hurt my family and friends. So anyway, God says, you're not ready. And I says, I hope you don't think you're going to send me back into my body that's all shot up laying in the jungles in the middle of a base camp in Vietnam. I'm not going to go back. And people said, you argued with God? And I said, yeah, he, he wins. <laughs> He's the final word, you know. But I said, uh, if you put me back in my body, I'm going to make sure I die. You can't do this to me. You can't show me heaven an infinite life where I'll live forever and happy and loved and, and I'll see all my family and friends and then send me back for that body in the jungle. He, and I remember he said, or the thought, but it was like words in my head. It's like, no, no. He said it like, no, no, you cannot take this. Only I can give this to you. And if you ever try to take it, it'll never be yours. And I don't, I call it religious speak. I don't, talked that way but I said okay father your will be done and that's when I went back through the tunnel of light and love and back into my body and then um I'm still wasn't conscious and Steve said uh it's funny but he said I was crying all that he said he drugged me around I didn't know again this till lately that um we did that article that my uh, breathing stopped that he had to give me CPR and he got me going again. And then quite a bit later, the Huey came in and got us and brought us to the hospital. And it was interesting there that that's when it got bad because they got me on the operating table. They got me conscious and still black. I couldn't see anything. And the pain, they started cutting on me without anesthesia because they said it would slow my heart. And that was horrible. I didn't know the human body could hurt that bad. 
they got me strapped down cutting on my arm and then uh all of a sudden all the pain went away and i started feeling real good again and and then i heard my gunner or my crew chief say that's okay steve you're going to be okay now you're going to be okay and i thought that was strange because everybody called me punjab that was my nickname and he always called me mr cardipy and i thought why did he call me that and why did he yell in my ear why did they let him get that close to me on the operating table that was just recently said i could not have heard him cuz he wasn't even in the room he was there i went flat line they started yelling we're losing him we're losing him and they said get him out of here and they ran hit my my gunner my crew chief out of the room and when he was walking away he said i know you're gone He said I I drug you around the woods for two or the jungle for two and a half three hours you were in pain screaming and crying and now you die on me. I should have let you die then instead of going through hours of pain which of course he didn't know I was going through hours of heaven. Uh I said how could I have heard you? He said I said it in my mind. I said I heard you like you were screaming in my ear. He said that must have been when you went flatline again for the I guess the third time. Once in the jungle once when he gave me CPR. and uh there's a connection when we move out of this body that we've got you know you know powers that the mind can't comprehend but i figure that means he had some plan for me he didn't send me back for uh i don't quite know what the purpose is except to help other people he wants us to help other people love each other you know what we do to each other my mind can't comprehend why why people for a little bit of money or a little bit of prestige or promotion we do to each other what we do and i do know that makes him sad